tells us about Jesus' encounter with these early disciples that if, we don't, if we're not reading carefully, we will think that maybe they're talking about the same thing. And, and I think that Bill Hull in his book, Jesus Christ, Disciple Maker, has really honed in on the, on the chronology of this. For about a four-month period, he introduced himself to these folks saying, come, come and see. They, and then he let them go. He let them go back to their homes, their, their professions. And then he, he comes back with an invitation, come and follow me. We're going to start looking at that tonight. This, first, this second phase, the first part of that. If you have Mark chapter 1 in your Bibles, I, I think, do we have it on the, on the screen? All right. There we go. Stand with me if you would. I'm, I'm going to read verses 16 to 20. We're going to go farther than that, but I want to just kind of set the context, set the table for the shift in Jesus' disciple-making strategy or in the next phase. It's not, he, he hasn't changed his mind. He's simply, we would say, shifting gears, ramping it up a little more. We're going to see that through these four phases, Lord willing, as we go through these together. Mark chapter 1, 16 to 20. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boats, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, when you just back away from that and pretend you haven't read it most of your adult life and some of your life as a child, you have to be shocked by that. Just stop a minute. What would that look like today? You're in a store, shopping. You've picked out some items, whatever they are. Maybe you've gone to the counter, getting everything together. And some fellow walks up to the clerk and says, come follow me. And they, they, they walk away. That's what happened. Well, we just read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And it will teach us a lot if we will be teachable. And I think you're here tonight because you're teachable. So let's study together. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, think of, put yourself in the place of these disciples. For four months they followed him to come and see. Come and see where he lived, and he, he just slept outside, basically. Man, sometimes he'd stay in somebody's home. He, to come and see him engage people, to, to heal the sick, to, to encounter the religious leaders, they just, they, they watched and they observed, and, and it was, they'd never seen anything like this in their lives. And then he sends them back home. He was introducing them to himself. And we've said this, and you're going to hear it over and over again. When you study Jesus honestly in the Gospels, you will not find the buttonholing fix. Man, let's strike while the iron's hot. We're going to miss an opportunity to get this person to Christ. Jesus didn't operate that way. He always gave someone an opportunity not to make a commitment. And look, there's a, there's a several-week study in that, folks. Our churches, or perhaps our church roles, not here, not here, but I'm speaking generally, are filled with the names of people who were, uh, <laughs> I'll use this, were given the bums rush, coaxed into a decision of some level, fizzled. So Jesus sends them back. 
About four months later, he shows up again there, and it's predictable where they are. They're back on the seashore. They're fishermen. They're doing what they know to do. But they had a they had a they had something to think. But when he went back, they had they had been hoisted between two worlds. A world that Jesus introduced them to that they'd never known anything about and the world that they had grown up knowing about and living in. So there they are. And one writer suggests that when they were mending their nets, fishing, that they couldn't get Jesus out of their minds. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that's true. You, you know, we can, we can wander a field, but you cannot get Jesus out of your minds when you've met him. Now, you can get stories of Jesus out of your minds if you've never met him. You can, you, you can, there's a lot of things, but you cannot get Jesus out of your minds when you've met him. So, he left them to think, pray, struggle with this question. Should I follow him? We, uh, I, this this. Christian culture plays so fast and loose with that and I, and I want to be careful because I don't want to go off on a tangent here tonight but in our area there's a church that I was made aware of I'm not going to call their name had a big Easter deal a young lady preteen was taken through it at the end pressed to make a decision she did served communion right there So, well, Pastor, don't be harsh. How do you know she wasn't saved? I've talked with her. I've talked with her. Jesus knew none of this stuff. And I, thought, I don't think would approve of... of there's, a, uh, there's a fellow, a friend of mine, J.D. Greer, who's running for convention president of the SBC this summer, this June in Kansas City. And he, he wrote a book, and it's caused quite a bit of controversy. The book is entitled, Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. It's unscriptural. So he sends them off. Should I follow him? That's the question. That, that's the question everyone has to ask at some point if they've been introduced to him. Should I follow him? He comes back now and he puts it before them a little... It's not come and see this time. Not just come and observe... It's, Come and follow me. Come more engaged. They're going to live for the world. Or they're going to live for Jesus. That was the choice. And really it continues to be our choice. We can live in the world. We don't have to become monastic. We don't have to wander, wander around the earth with peripatetic teachers. But we're, we're in the world but not of the world. Every day we get up. I have to ask the question, am I going to live for the world today or live for Jesus today? So that's what he puts before them. And it is incredible. One writer I was reading said, said what Jesus did there would make salesmen and politicians salivate to have that kind of command with people. But it wasn't that. It wasn't that. This is a group of guys that are slow to learn. We're going to, if you've read the Gospels, you know that. They're slower still to unlearn some of the things that they, the baggage they bring with them. They bring all the Jewish passions, all the Jewish prejudices with them. So why did they follow him so readily? This is the, for any evangelist, that's the question. Because they had already been with him. Now, how does, that, how does that translate for us? Because Jesus is not physically walking around the earth. Dear people, in the early church, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. When people are with us, they should know more about Jesus from having been with us. And we've sinned against them if they don't. We want to see people come to know Christ. We also 
observe when we, when we take the look at what we've looked at the last several weeks. They immediately followed Christ because they were given an in invitation, not a responsibility. Are you aware of how many people who are approached by church people feel like the church is wanting something from them? You want, uh, you want my body for your numbers so you, so you can say you're growing. You want my pocketbook for your, for your budget. You want me to plug in gaps where you have needs for service. Jesus simply gave an invitation. He didn't, he didn't give a responsibility to them. Follow me. One writer said this. He, did, he didn't say, follow me and I will make you leaders and preachers. Or, or he didn't say to Peter, Peter, the future of the church rests in your hands. You'll give the inaugural message for the church. And you'll take your place as the first pope. He didn't tell him that. He didn't say, John, you're going to be imprisoned and persecuted greatly for my sake. Jesus gave the information that those seeking him can handle. Follow me. Follow me. And would put back more and more light. I've used this illustration before in the, in the past years. It's, it's the issue of illumination. You know, when you talk about the Scripture, the Bible is revelation. It's complete. Revelation is complete. complete. Every now and then we slip and we'll say, well, God revealed. No, God didn't reveal this. He, he's finished his revelation. Illumination is the opening of eyes increasingly to see what was always there before. And this is where you, when you go in, if you've ever been in a cave, you ever been in Carlsbad Caverns or any caves, like caves up in, uh, toward, on the way to, uh, to Branson, you go in and initially your eyes have to adjust. And, and as they adjust, people around you would think you very strange if you looked around and go, now, when did they move these stalagmites in here? I didn't see them earlier. When did they get the stalactite? No, they've been there all the time. You, you're simply being illumined. Light is being given to open up and see what's already. Well, that's what Jesus, that's how Jesus dealt with these uh, early disciples. He, he would illuminate them. He gave them no hardline ultimatums. No forced behavior. In fact, it's fascinating. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He took responsibility for them. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. One thing we've got to recognize as disciples who want to be disciple makers is that when we, when we invite someone to follow Christ, <laughs> and then have to demonstrate a patience as we walk beside them. Not too quick to close the deal and, quote, get a convert. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you travel halfway around the world to make a convert for yourself, and when you're finished with him, he's twice the son of hell as you. We have to take responsibility that we will walk with this person. That we're not simply interested in seeing them make a decision, make a commitment, come to Christ. We want to see them grow, recognizing that we too need to grow. That we want them to grow with us. We should expose new converts to positive experiences. That's, that's why positive evangelistic experiences, uh, positive church life, that's, that's why we must, we must fight with every fiber of our being that we not have conflict here. Conflict in a church is a, is a killer for young converts. Jesus used this model, what we call show and tell. And here, I read this illustration, I thought this was great. It said, suppose you take a group on a van or a bus to a, to a beach trip on a beautiful day. He said, notice what would happen. Some would immediately jump off the bus, shed their gear, sprint toward the beach, and do a somersault into the surf. Some would sunbathe. They'd lie out. and Others would go for a walk. A few would possibly remain in street clothes, not venturing near the water. Now, if the leader's goal is to get everybody in the water, how's that going to happen? 
Well, we can think of several ways, but there's only one response. That's to take several trips to the beach. To get everybody acclimated to the beach. And, and as you go back and back and back again, the leader leads the way. He's the first one off the boat. He's the one that runs. And, and as you continue to do that, there's, and you, you, if you can probably think about situations, you've seen where there was a loosening of that. That's the analogy here. The discipler will keep exposing the people that, that you're working with to positive evangelistic experiences until the, even the most hesitant feel comfortable to share the gospel. So, you know, the disciples, another thing we need to see is they, just, they, they dropped everything to follow Jesus because so I said, they'd been with him before. He gave them an invitation, not a responsibility. And he called them to a vision, not a job. <laughs> the work of the church must not be reduced to simply church work. Church work is, can be wearisome. He called them to a vision. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Get yourself inside the head of these, these men who fished for fish. I'll make you fishers of men. How did they hear that? I mean, they were good Jews. They wanted to see more people. They wanted to see Gentiles come into the kingdom of God to become Jewish proselyte converts. They... They believed the promises to Abraham. They wanted the people of God to be number, numberless like the sands of the sea and stars in the sky. And this was a great way that Jesus communicated to them. We're going to see in the next study where he, uh, where he takes that a little, little farther. When he calls a person, Jesus calls a person, he calls us to a purpose, a dream, a goal, or a life-changing vision. So I want to ask you just a moment. Think. You may, you may want to talk about this when we have our conversation. In a minute. Think. What was it that drew you to Jesus? Now I know an awareness of our sin, our need to be saved, our need to be cleansed. All those things are factors. But in the context of that, what was it about Jesus that presented such a compelling vision for you? What, what, what was it about Jesus that clarified your purpose? Because he called these men to that. Follow me. He didn't say, follow me and, I'm, I'll, and you won't burn in hell for eternity. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It was true that in following him, coming to him, they would not burn in hell for eternally, eternity. But there was something more compelling than that. We've got to be careful in engaging people that we not unwilling, unwittingly introduce them to, to leaven. If you, you, we've studied leaven in, in the Gospel of Mark. There's, basically, leaven is used in four different pictures in the New Testament. It's, it, the leaven, of course, is what would be called the spiritual yeast of sin. There's a leaven of hypocrisy. Jesus talked about that in the Pharisees, the leaven of the Pharisees. The, to pretend to be one thing and be a hypocrite, be something else. It's deadening. Uh, the leaven of rationalization, where you can just kind of justify anything. The, re, the, the leaven of impurity, 1 Corinthians 5. Get rid of the leaven, he says, in that situation of the immoral man. Then the leaven of legalism in Galatians 5, where where the, the gospel of grace was being hijacked by works righteousness. And he, he said, don't, don't let that leaven ruin the, the loaf of God's grace. This kind of stuff kills enthusiasm and it saps the heart and desire out of the life of someone for ministry. So this writer said this, when the work of the church becomes just church work, when the work of the ministry becomes simply a job rather than a vision, it's time to reevaluate what's going on. 
There were two, two boys who were friends whose fathers both worked uh, at the same place as riveters in an airplane factory. One boy said, they asked, what does your father do? Oh, my father's just a riveter. The other boy, what does your father do? My dad builds airplanes. Which one has vision? See? What do people, what do people think of the kingdom of, of Christ, the kingdom of God, as they, as they get around us and, and hear us speak about it, see us? Are we thrilled? Jesus gave them a compelling vision. We've got to guard against, against talking about leaven, against criticism and being critical. You see, being visionary and being, having a critical spirit, don't, they don't dwell together. And a critical Christian, so-called, would, would lose or has lost their vision for what God began to do in their lives. Sometimes you just have to go back to, uh, to where it all started for you and Jesus. And uh, we'll answer questions in a few minutes. There's. And here's what happens on the continuum. The closer you draw to a critical spirit, the farther you draw away from the, from the joy and excitement and the, of the, the vision, the goal, the purpose that, that God birthed in your heart when he saved you. Contrarily, when you, when you grow closer to that, then, then that other spirit is left behind. Let's talk about briefly... And what, how we must be established as followers of Jesus if we're going to help others get established, get grounded and founded. There are four pillars I want to suggest to you that have got to be active in every life of every believer who will, who will grow as a disciple and become a disciple maker. First, there is, there is Bible study. You will not speak word of truth into the life of somebody if the, if the Bible is not a book familiar to you. Bible study. Yes, in, in groups to be sure, but also your own, your own Bible study. Reading the Word of God with, with comprehension. Then prayer wouldn't surprise you. Prayer. We, we see Jesus. We're going to see Him drawing aside. When, when the crowds are pressing in the hardest, He draws aside to pray. Fellowship. Fellowship being koinonia, that, that having a... Do we, do we have a common sense? So it doesn't matter how different we are, where we come from, how we were, how we were raised. The, is, the, is the common experience of grace we have in our lives greater than any differences we could point to? That's fellowship. That's sharing all things common. It works itself out in a lot of ways. Bearing one another's burdens, stepping up, meeting the needs of one another. Encouraging one another, praying for one another, fellowship, and then witnessing. These are four pillars, and, and, the, and the roof, the, the house of Christianity will not be safe. A healthy, nurturing environment with one of these missing. Just sharing the gospel. A fellowship of, of believers should be marked by encouragement, exhortation, comfort, and accountability to give a balance to life. One of the things we notice about Jesus in Mark's gospel is he, look at this with me, in Mark 1.21, he, uh, he showed them how. He went into the synagogue. They went with him on, on the Sabbath to Capernaum. And he was teaching. And notice how the people responded. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. What, that's, you, know, you feel sorry for the scribes at that point. You, you, you almost wish they said he taught as one of authority uh, better than the scribes. No, just, he taught as one with authority, not like the scribes teach. Implication with no authority. Jesus' message stirred the hearts of people. It, and you see, we're not talking about teaching skills here. We're talking about a
compassion for who God is and what he's done in my life. And speaking that from, from what the scripture says happens to a person who's encountered God. He set the example. He taught them how. So these four fundamentals, we've got to look and see how am I doing, how am I, am I further being grounded in the Word? Doesn't matter if we've, if we've uh, just started studying the Word, the young person, child, or if we've been studying the Word for a lot of years. I mean, I, you know, I'm coming close to being 40 years beyond seminary. I, I studied the Word before I got to seminary, but I, uh, and I haven't stopped, and I don't intend to stop because I'm continually being taught by the Spirit. Wounded by the Spirit, encouraged by the Spirit, blessed by the Spirit, enlightened by the Spirit. Grateful that I didn't stop studying. Prayer. We never get too old. One day, when we go from this life to heaven, prayer as we understand it will be set aside and praise will take its place and will be all predominant. Fellowship. We'll never stop fellowshipping. Once we're brought into the body of Christ, whenever we're witnessing, we'll stop. But really, what is witnessing? We've said it several ways. Witnessing is one beggar who's found bread telling another beggar where he can find bread or offering bread to that beggar. Someone said witnessing is going out and enlisting people to sing in the celestial choir. We're going to all be singing praise and glory in heaven, and we ought to want, we ought to, want to enlist as many people as possible. While he's teaching in the synagogue in Mark's gospel, we've been through all this, so I'm just kind of hitting the highlights for you. There's a man with an evil spirit who cries out. Look at this in verse, in verse 23 and 24. He cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Put yourself again where these disciples were. They have, they have come to, coming to some conclusions about Jesus. He's, he's an incredible teacher. He speaks, ministers the word of God with power and now he encounters and subdues demons. The typical response to demons in Jesus' day was if they, if they popped up in the synagogue they had no place there, they would escort them, grab the human being inhabited by them and take them out, throw them out, cast whatever they could do to get out of the way. If they met with them in the marketplace and they would turn and, and walk away, run from them. You did not encounter them typically. And it's just the irony here. Every time Jesus encounters demons in the New Testament, they acknowledge who he is. More than the Pharisees were ever willing to do. The demons said, we know who you are. The Holy One of God. The Holy One of God meaning the Messiah. So we, the, the encounter is they come out with this, uh, with this shriek. And there the people stand and observe. What does this mean? What is this? New teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. He's exposing his disciples. Remember little by little. Now he's not just a teacher who teaches with authority. His, his, his authoritative teaching has, has an impact, makes a difference. And folks, people need to see that in our lives. That they're not interested in knowing how much we know about Jesus' teaching. What people want to know in our day and time is they want to know what difference has Jesus' teaching made in our life. How has it impacted us? How has it changed us? What has it subdued in us? What, what has it brought out in us? And then we get to Mark 1, 29 and 31. <clears throat> because see, Jesus is impressing the people and his fame is going forth and the crowds are pressing. <coughs> and immediately he left the synagogue, entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. We know that Simon's mother-in-law Simon's mother lay ill with a fever and they told him about her. He came and took her by the hand he lifted her up. The fever left her. She began to serve them. Now what, a, what a powerful picture of an encounter with Jesus. 
It's very much similar to, to, to Saul of Tarsus when he's on the road to Damascus. He's going from one town to another trying to find followers of the way so he can round them up and either imprison them or in the case of Stephen, have them stoned to death. And he encounters Jesus. What, Lord, what would you have me to do? There's this, there's this impulse to serve when you encounter Jesus. And he's, he's showing this. Peter's mother-in-law gets up and she begins to serve them, presumably to feed them a meal. There's a word in this, by the way, for women. Maybe their children are grown. Maybe they're in the, in the sunset years. Jesus gives dignity to this woman. This woman was not beyond her use and she wasn't beyond his reach or his interest. Jesus gives dignity to people at all stages of life and would say to you, serve, serve. While you have breath in your nostrils, serve. Jesus showed them that while he preached primarily, while he came and he would, he would unveil toward the end of his ministry that he came to die, suffer and die, that, <coughs> that unlike the religious elite of the day, Jesus came and was interested in needs and in meeting needs and Brothers and sisters, that has to be one of the marks of us as followers of Jesus Christ. When we get tired of people with needs, we've gotten tired of ministering the gospel to them. So this is fascinating what happens next. Popularity is growing, and in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. We said the word, prayer, a prayerless life, one said, is a, is a breathless life. You'll suffocate. He prayed. One, I saw a sign one time that said, Come apart, A-P-A-R-T, or you will come apart. <laughs> Get it? Draw, draw aside, come apart, or you will come apart. We have to balance our life with, with ministry, with engaging people, and disengaging to be with God. I had a minister tell me when I was early in my ministry, he said, son, if, you're, if you just try to make yourself available to people all the time, you, you're never available for God. To be taught by God, to commune with God. Balance in the ministry is so critical. Balance in the life of the believer is so critical. When I, saw, I read one writer that said this, Our Lord did not have a messianic complex or some misguided notion that he had to be busy helping others every waking moment. So what happens? He draws aside to pray. The disciples still are not getting it. They've still got a lot to learn. There, there's some blanks that have got to be filled in for them, some gaps that have got to be shored up. So Simon and those who were with him searched for Jesus. They get up. He's not there. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Now what's the, what's the unspoken question here? Everyone is looking for you. He might as well have said, why, why, what are you doing here wasting time praying? There, there are needy people out here. The crowds are pressing in. They need you. you. So activity, one of the principles we learn from Jesus' model, activity is not always the answer to success. If we're not careful, we say it, we all need balance. Some people, some people are driven, just driven to meet needs, meet needs, meet needs, and they're just, they burn out and they burn out and they, they, they're just, they're flaming out. Preparation for that is as important as the meeting of them. Jesus models this for us. Jesus talked to God. It's a prerequisite for talking to men. In fact, it has been posited by some, some evangelism professors I had in seminary that if we would talk to God more about men, we would talk to men more about God. We heard yesterday in one of the videos we watched, 
And these, these guys that do these, these are great, on the edge, driving hard pastors. One of them said, we, we challenged 20% of our congregation. We, we knew we couldn't get all buy-in from all 100. 20% of our congregation, 20% of our leaders, to say, let's, let's engage in this. And so we began to pray. He said, you know, I began to pray for my neighbors. That's a pastor said that. He said, you know what happened? God began to drop my neighbors in my lap. God's not withholding our neighbors from us. Talking to God is a prerequisite to talking to men. So he's teaching them not only that, that, that the word has got to be authoritative and powerful, he's teaching them that prayer is foundational. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, effective and making disciples who are followers of Jesus, then we have got to be praying people. At prayer meeting on Wednesday night, it's a great time to come, but that's not the only time to pray. To, to pray, and so I want to challenge you. We may even do some of this more in application to write down. Write down the names of five people that you, that you touch. You, you have contact with them. Not, not praying for so-and-so who lives up in Canada. I'd like to see say there's nothing wrong. Pray for that person. But five people that you touch at some level that you'd love to see saved or love to see blossom with evidence that they're saved. And then commit to pray. They want Jesus to go back to the crowds. They want him to seize upon the opportunity for the popularity. But notice what he says in verse 38. Let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that's why I came. In other words, I did not come to be the superstar for the crowds. I came to preach and I came to preach as expansively as I can in the time that I have before I go do what I ultimately came to do. Balancing ministry. Jesus was not swept away by public opinion. In fact, you study his life, he chose the unpopular path. One of the speakers yesterday in the video said, Jesus was a sacrilegious iconoclast. I wrote that down. It's like I, and what he meant by that was Jesus did not care about the Pharisees' traditions, their religious traditions. No self-respecting Jew goes into Samaria. Jesus had to go to Samaria. We looked at that last week. We're going to look at him engaging a leper. No self-respecting Jew would touch a leper. The fact the leper, we're going to look at this next week, the leper was required to go around with his hand over the top lip going, Unclean! Unclean. So if you were just wandering along talking to somebody, not paying attention, you'd hear unclean and you would, oh, a leper's in the area. So you could make other plans, you could get around him. Jesus didn't care about that. He touched lepers. No, men, no self respecting Jew gave time to a woman of ill repute. Jesus reached down to a woman of ill repute who was brought to him and lifted her up. So, what's the important point in this? Well, if you're going to follow Jesus day by day, you need to expect to be criticized by people who, who don't appreciate that you may be functioning outside the norms, the religious norms. Jesus didn't care for them. He cared for people. So to wrap up now, what have we looked at in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 down th toward the end of the chapter? You have to understand, you have to appreciate that when, when Jesus encounters these guys again and takes them from being fishers of fish to fishers of men, this is transformational for them. And folks, our journey as disciples has got to be transformational. He taught them a lot in a little space. It's estimated when you put the chronology together that this, this phase lasts about 10 months. Come and follow me. He shows them the authority of Scripture. He teaches them the importance of prayer. He demonstrates how important it is to reach needy souls with the gospel. So a message from God we find in the Scriptures. A dialogue with God we find in prayer. 
spills over into a message to others, witnessing. John Stott, in his little book, it's a small book, easily despised, but I'll tell you what, you will read it and be on your knees before you're finished. Our guilty silence. It's about witnessing. He says this, that you can tell when a person has really worshipped God, not just in corporate worship, but maybe in your own private time of devotion. You can tell when a person has really worshipped God because he cannot help but witness. He says, also, you can tell when a person has been witnessing to others because he cannot help but worship God. He said it's a, it's a cycle that feeds itself. And silence breaks the cycle. So, the same Jesus who introduced his power to take water and make it wine is introducing a new wine to these followers. He is a rabbi, yes. He will have synagogue privileges as he's asked to go in and read in the synagogue. But he has introduced a new wine. A new taste. A new quality of what it means to be a follower of God. Because it ultimately means to be a follower of Jesus. And it ultimately means to be a follower of Jesus who engages others that they too may become followers of Jesus. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. How about? What do you uh, what do you see in the passage? What as we're going through it, just just letting it speak for itself. What what jumps out at you in Mark chapter one? 